St. Petersburg, I think the number one thing that has been most instrumental is just starting the conversation, making sure that affordable housing is something that we are all working together collaboratively on. We can't just focus on only the low income or only the market rate housing. We have to have something for people in the middle, our first responders, our teachers, the people that bag your groceries, that make your meal in a restaurant. They deserve a safe and sustainable place to live in our city, just like everyone else. This is a human rights issue. This is a dignity issue. It's a quality of life issue, and it affects all of us. Affordable housing, workforce housing, market rate housing, it's all really important to a diverse and incredibly vibrant St. Petersburg. And so as we continue to redevelop our city, we have to look at opportunity for everyone to fit within that redevelopment. When land is scarce and development is expensive, we as the city have looked at ways that we can incentivize that and that we can really start to help developers be able to build the stock that we need. I encourage other cities and other elected officials who maybe are not as familiar with the housing need to get out into the community and start talking to the people who we're looking to serve. Affordable housing is not a one solution problem. It's going to take a lot of work, it's going to take a lot of creative ideas, and it's going to take a lot of people at the table. And so just start. Start having the conversation, start building coalitions of other like-minded people within the community. There are so many great things happening across the county to tackle this problem. Let's work together to create leaders that will continue to provide homes for people for the next decade. It's great to hear from Council Member Gabbard about how the City of St. Petersburg is embracing this conversation. In fact, just yesterday, the City of St. Pete City Council heard from Yimby St. Pete about their policy recommendations for affordable housing. I'm Blake Lyon, Director of Pinellas County's Building and Development Review Services. Welcome to the third session of the Homes for Pinellas Virtual Summit Series. If you missed either of our first two sessions, you'll find the recordings at homesforpinellas.org. Our topic today is local government innovation. I'd like to start things off by giving you a little overview of what you can expect from today's session. First, we'll hear from three panelists who have experience working in city government, county government, and consulting. Then we'll spend a good amount of time talking about innovations in housing policy and practices across the country. Some may connect with these concepts more than others, and that's fine. The idea is to talk about what other communities are doing so we can learn, since this is a problem affecting the whole country. We want to have a solution-based conversation about what options are out there and what solutions you might be able to bring to your community. Also, we'll take your questions, so please use the Q&A feature in Zoom, type your questions in, or give a thumbs up to questions that other people have asked. Our speakers will share some of their examples, but feel free to put in your own ideas or areas that you'd like to discuss. We're gonna start off with our first speaker, Jerry Campos Lopez. Jerry is the Director of Redevelopment and Economic Development Opportunity in Manatee County, Florida. She is a certified economic developer with over 20 years of experience spanning redevelopment, economic development, and affordable housing markets in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Before Jerry joined Manatee County, she was the Director of Economic Development for Clearwater. She has also worked as a housing consultant assisting housing authorities in Memphis, Boston, and Houston. Jerry, it's good to have you with us. Good morning. Thanks, Blake. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you all today. I'm really excited to share with you um, what we're doing here in Manatee County. Um, we are always looking for great um, opportunities for best practices and innovative ideas. So also looking forward to hearing ideas um, from the group um, so that we can be stronger as a region as we go through and we share um, all of our ideas. Um, so what I would like to, um, to talk to you today, I'm going to be um, sharing my screen um, as part of my my, uh, my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So what I'd like to just kind of kick it off just um, overall is in thinking about affordable housing. When we first um, started talking to our board of county commissioners about affordable housing, um, there was just a lot of confusion. So what we started talking to them about isn't necessarily what is affordable housing, but really who. We really wanted to bring a face to the issue and get them a better understanding of really who it is that we're talking about when we, when we talk about affordable housing and that need. Um, so what we started talking about with them is looking at our own county employees, because when you're talking about who needs this kind of housing, it's really our own frontline employees. Um, so we broke it down a little bit about what were um, the salaries um, that they were making. And uh, the average Manatee County salary for frontline employees um, is approximately $45,000, $46,000. Um, when we look at um, other um, workforce um, type of positions, um, librarians were in the, um, the $58,000 range. Law enforcement officers start out at approximately forty-nine dollars to $50,000. A dental assistant, about $35,000. Teachers at about forty-one, dollars And retail associates at $21,000. So this is really who makes up our workforce. So when we're talking about that, it's really looking at demand of who is going to be using um, using the housing. Um, so one of the things in terms of explaining um, who is using it is really what can they afford. And this is always a topic for affordable housing when we use that rule of thumb of about 30 to 33 percent of your salary should go to, um, to housing. So when you look at that um, $46,000 that the household afford, this really means that they can afford to pay no more than about $1,200 for rent and a mortgage that's $165,000. Um, I know as part of the video that um, kicked it off today, we were talking about the middle. So when we're looking at that 100% of our area median income and you look uh, you look at what they can afford, um, it goes up to about $200,000 for that sales price of a home. So that puts your monthly payment at approximately maybe like $1,400. And when you go a little bit uh, above that median, still in that middle income range at 120%, then you go up to about um, $225,000. So when we put that against what the average price of a single family home is um, in Manatee County, um, it's $325,000. So that means that pretty much the majority of our own workforce in the county cannot afford to buy an average um, single, um, single family home in, in our own county. Um, when we're looking at rent, um, the average rent for a two bedroom apartment in Bradenton is about 1200. So it's just about that, um, that amount. But then you come into an issue of supply is how decent are these two bedrooms and where are they located? Are they near where it is that they need to work? So we were making the case of the need for why it was that we needed to look at it a different way. So then when we go, so the whole issue of the who is affordable housing really is a, a demand question. When we go into the, the what is it, we're looking at more of a, of a supply and, and what it is that's, that's available um, in the market. Um, but one of the key things that I really wanted to stress when we talk about general um, affordability of housing is at least us in the affordable housing world um, talk about uh, capital A, like big A affordable and little a affordable. So um, there's just naturally occurring um, affordable housing or housing that is affordable throughout our region. And that means that um, they just happen, just happen naturally. Um, the little, um, so that's a little a affordable, I'm sorry. The big A is really that's that subsidized. So that is some kind of public assistance that's needed to be able to make um, those projects a reality. So some sort of um, subsidy that's needed um, to, to fill that gap. And as you saw from what is a, what our workforce can afford to what's available, um, there is definitely that gap, which um, translates into a lot of funding. Um, the other thing in terms of, of affordable housing and um, the St. Pete Council member talked about that in her comments is that affordable housing really is more than, than a social and a moral case for why we need it and why it's important. There's a real business case for it that we all need to do a better job 
of, of explaining and, um, and talking about. Um, studies show better school achievement, more productive employees, and of course, stronger neighborhoods because of our tax base when we do have um, more affordable housing. So overall, as part of our conversations with our commissioners, um, our goal really was as part of our strategy to be able to encourage both that naturally occurring um, as well as the, the subsidized. So both our little A and our um, big A affordable housing. So we have developed um, an eight point strategy for how to approach our affordable housing um, issues here in Manatee County. And we call this our eight point strategy. And it's really about looking at this issue from every single angle that you can think of. So here from our conversations, and we had lots of focus groups, we had great partnerships with our Chamber of Commerce to engage our stakeholders and those that really had an interest in coming up with solutions of who were all the different players, what were all the different categories that we can approach solutions to affordable housing in our county. Um, so the first one is really working with developers. What would it take to build and sell below $192,000? That's really our cutoff um, for um, that affordability, um, looking at that 120% um, that of the area median and, and below what they can afford. Um, so what needs to happen for them to be able to build and sell below that price point? Uh, looking at employers, this has been the toughest one of all of these items on the list. How do we engage them um, to provide the solutions? And we've had some conversations, but haven't gotten enough traction on them. So this is one we're still working on. Um, looking at banks, how can financial institutions provide more favorable loan products? Like it's very difficult if you have a young family that wants to buy a home that needs a lot of renovation. A lot of times the cost of the home, if you include those costs of renovations, it becomes an unaffordable. Um, so how can that happen to be able to, um, to help provide some of these ideas and some more creative, creative options? Um, are there revolving loan funds? Um, this is uh, one um, area that we're working with, with our local um, credit union to see if there's a way to be able to get a revolving loan fund to be able to help with some of these items, including um, uh, equity lines of credits for um, for affordable housing developers. Innovation, what are new materials and processes that are available? This is one that we're looking for a lot of ideas. Our land development code, um, what is needed for, um, for more density, smaller, um, smaller lots and smaller units. We've done a lot of work in this area over the last two years. We have um, some really solid um, bonus density uh, programs that, um, that we have established and we're continuing to tweak and, and kind of make it easier from that side to be able to build. Fees, this is one that has been a real pain point for our developers. How can we right size those impact fees and other fees? And this has been um, kind of really difficult because even though we would love to see um, very few fees for affordable housing, they still have an impact on transportation, on our stormwater and sewer system. So who pays for that then? So, um, so that's been uh, lots of conversations that we've had there. Land, this is again, one of the key pain points. How can we reduce the cost of the land? Um, we are looking into uh, community land trust and seeing um, how that can work here and what we need to do. And then of course, some financial incentives. What are some of these funding alternatives? What are some new programs and sources? So we're looking at our affordable housing strategies from all of these points. We're working more on some um, than others to try to see some progress and try to go through. Uh, the main program that I just wanted to share with you all is our Livable Manatee program. This is a program that we created in August of 2017 because the main pain point from developers that we heard is that our impact fees um, were just too high to be able to really make the cost of those uh, single family homes able to be, um, to be affordable. Um, so we created this program that actually pays for 100% of the impact fees. So not just the county fees, but also our facility invest investment fees, which is all of our utility fees, as well as law enforcement, library, and the school board fees, which for us is a lot. So right now it's really averaging about um, 16 to $18,000 per home that the county pays for, um, for these homes. So 
uh, so far, we've had some really great results. Um, we've had 42 single family infills that have been developed. Um, we were able to move towards multifamily rental. We have three rental projects totaling 308 um, units, 188 of those are under construction. So we're really excited about that. Um, so I'm sure a question that's on everyone's brain is how are we paying for this? Um, we started with about $3.5 million. Um, this is from our general fund dollars. Um, so this is a commitment that our board had that was really important as a priority. Um, so they put that into, um, into the general fund that we're using. Um, this, um, the response that we got for developers was actually much higher than what I expected. So that was a good challenge and a good problem to have. Um, so we were able, um, with our um, redevelopment district, it's not a CRA, we just have a, a redevelopment area, but we do have tax increment financing and the TIF. So we were able to move or allocate a million dollars of our TIF dollars to be able to pay um, for projects that are in our redevelopment area. So we were able to accomplish that. And then we do have a lot in the pipeline. We're actually moving more towards subdivisions. Um, we have four single family subdivisions that at least 25% of those homes are going to be affordable. And then we have one mixed income rental projects that's 88 units that's also in the pipeline. So just a quick example, um, this is one of the homes um, with our livable manatee um, program. Um, this one's about 1200 square feet, uh, two bed, two bath, the sales price was 160,000. A low income buyer, so one that was 80% and below um, did move in. Um, this is where we layer a lot of our programs and a lot of our resources. We used our, our SHIP, which is the state um, program um, to assist with down payment. This was a $28,000 um, and um, a down payment assistance and impact fees here were almost about 12. Um, so this is just the interior of the home. Um, as you can see, very light and uh, bright and airy. And uh, the homeowner was so excited to be able to move in here. And um, here, um, one thing that I wanted to point out is these are all uh, just for-profit developers. Um, these are just uh, infill developers that wanted to do the right thing, wanted to build affordable housing. And um, we're just finding lots and just building. And then as part of the Livable Manatee program, they were able to make their numbers work. Uh, the last one I wanted to showcase as an example, um, this is a project that's under construction right now. It's Sandpiper Place um, by Blue Sky um, Developers. You had them on your webinar um, a couple of weeks ago talking about one of the uh, several of the projects that they have. So this is one that we worked um, for almost two years to be able to get this project going. But this is over a $20 million uh, total development cost um, to um, uh, for our Southwest district, which is on, in our um, redevelopment area. And uh, so it's gonna be 96 rental units. And we use as part of that low income housing tax credit process, that local government contribution to be able to, um, to get this one done. Um, so just kind of to wrap up, um, just some of the developer pain points that we are still hearing. Of course, I talked about the impact fees and the solution was our livable manatee program. Um, the cost of land is still something that's a real um, struggle because just land costs are just increasing. Um, so we are reviewing a community land trust model and we're looking at lots of different examples um, throughout the state. And the other really exciting thing is that we were able to allocate some of our TIF um, funding um, as well as some additional funding to really try to do a land acquisition program that we have some funds that we can try to buy some of that land and then seeing if there's a way to then link that back to our community land trust model. Um, and then some of the other things that we're looking at is um, kind of impact fees and land are these really big, uh, really big components. But don't overlook some of the really small items that can really be barriers for developers. Um, for us, it's been the cost of replacing trees in, in rental developments. Um, we have kind of that, this one for one replacement program. So that cost actually became really high and that's and something that was just not anticipated. So that became a real issue. So we do have this tree protection um, trust fund program, but 
um, we really want to highlight and make it a policy for affordable housing to be a priority so that we can access that, so that we can kind of keep the projects going and relieve that, that pressure on um, that part. Because we do want to replace the trees. It's just the cost of it is really, um, really big. The other one um, are some um, minimal items like water connection fees, um, reviewing the timing of the fees. This one for us, for example, um, it was done on a six month um, uh, kind of time frame, but uh, the, um, the recommendation is if you start with three months and maybe they can save some money. So it's every little bit helps is what I'm saying. And so don't, even though looking at the big things is important, making sure you're also looking at the little thing to make sure that you are um, facilitating that um, as much as possible. Um, I'd like to end with um, a really exciting um, project um, that's um, coming up. Um, many of you know um, the Urban Land Institute, ULI Tampa Bay. I am their chair of their housing um, affordability uh, committee. And so we've been kind of thinking about um, these ideas and what needs to be done and that middle missing middle housing is something that's really important. Um, so one of the things that's um, coming up is um, Forward Pinellas um, has uh, given a grant to the city of St. Pete and they're working on uh, really looking at this missing middle housing, as you heard. So ULI is um, uh, looking to contract um, with them um, to be able to look for some of those finance solutions. So how can uh, we review the financial markets and those um, just small um, small time developers um, that are looking to be able to build maybe between one and four units um, or accessory dwelling units, how can you actually finance those? Um, so that's that's been a real barrier. So the hope is for as part of this um, scope that we'll be able to provide a set of recommendations to be able to see how they can do that. Um, so the real exciting piece of this is that um, once this is completed, um, hopefully this can be scalable and a great example for others to be able to use. So thank you, Blake, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate your thoughts and insights and certainly hearing a little bit more about what our neighbors to the south are doing and what might be transferable over here to Pinellas County and particularly interested in hearing uh, what you're doing with ULI. We're going to move now into our second speaker. Uh, Richard or Rick Perez is the Planning and Development Service Division Manager for the City of Largo. With 17 years of experience in community development and urban planning, He's a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners, a certified redevelopment professional with Florida Redevelopment Association. Rick, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Blake. Um, uh, let me pull up my presentation here. Great. Well, I, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, panel. Uh, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm a uh, planner by trade, um, not an affordable housing expert, but I've had the great opportunity through these uh, about 17 years of practicing planning uh, to, to touch upon many affordable housing projects from concept to completion. And so um, I'm, I want to thank you for being a part of this, uh, for allowing me to be a part of this panel. Uh, so in terms of Largo and what we are doing uh, with affordable housing and, and trying to be proactive, we recognize that we have an important role to play in the provision of diverse uh, quality attainable housing for a broad spectrum of the population in Pinellas County. Uh, Largo is the third largest city in Pinellas County uh, and it is located at the center of both the county and the greater Tampa Bay area. Uh, and adjacent to the Gateway Employment Center, which is the second largest employment hub in the, uh, in the region. Uh, furthermore, uh, three of the county's designated transit investment corridors that serve Pinellas County run through our jurisdiction, uh, US 19, uh, East Bay uh, Drive, uh, Roosevelt Boulevard, or State Road 686, and alternate US 19, which provides a lot of access to the larger region. Uh, while, while Largo utilizes a full range of uh, conventional affordable housing programs uh, funded by HUD and SHIP, um, our comprehensive plan policy encourages affordable housing to be incorporated into market rate projects and uh, therefore predominantly um, uh, focusing on, on private market uh, solution. 
Um, this helps to ensure that the affordable units that are uh, produced are indistinguishable from, from market rate uh, units. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, our comp plan also directs us to focus our, our affordable housing uh, efforts um, in being a part of the compact and, and mixed use development that we seek to encourage in our activity centers, mixed use corridors in our, our major employment centers. Uh, Largo's primary tool for this is uh, to promote affordable housing through uh, density bonus incentives. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those projects. Um, we have a policy that, that allows us to provide density bonuses citywide, but there are some limitations in terms of the additional density that they can get that, that doesn't quite attract throughout the city um, uh, the, as many projects as we'd like. But to a certain extent, that's okay because higher density is not appropriate just anywhere, but merits further discussion and critical analysis uh, of, of what is higher density and what is acceptable in different areas of the city. Bottom line, location matters, uh, not just as it relates to density, but equally as important uh, accessibility to all the things that uh, and places people need to get to uh, work, education, child care, medical care, uh, grocery stores, good, and other goods and services. To date, the successes that um, we are seeing in terms of delivering higher density, uh, market driven affordable housing uh, is in the community redevelopment area, um, which generally focuses around our downtown area and made up of two districts that are adjacent. Um, and a lot of opportunity in the near term in our two uh, major activity centers, as you can see here on the map, the Largo Tri-City and uh, Largo Mall Activity Centers. Um, in the Clearwater Largo Road Community re Redevelopment Area, we have two multifamily projects underway uh, that have received density bonuses for setting aside a percentage of units for workforce housing. Um, which is, is uh, rent set at what is determined affordable for uh, households with incomes of up to 120% of the uh, area median income. Um, both of these projects happen to be conveniently uh, located adjacent to the Pinellas Trail, allowing for bicycling to both downtown Largo, uh, Clearwater and other uh, destinations within a short distance. <clears throat> Uh, to talk a little about those projects, first we have the Rosary Apartments um, located at uh, Clearwater Largo Road and Rosary Road. Um, this project is a is a, about a little more than an eight acre site uh, with uh, 224 units, 20% um, of which are dedicated to workforce housing for a term of 30 years, uh, and and this allowed for an increase in density from 15 units to 27 units per acre. Uh, the, the project's estimated at around $11 million to, uh, for complete construction. And the, the construction coincided uh, with the city's reconstruction of Rosary Road to make it a, a more complete street, which includes a, a multi-use path connection to the Pinellas Trail, which is just uh, immediately adjacent to the, uh, to the west. Um, the developer, working with the developer and, and uh, fostering that relationship of, of collaboration, they dedicated uh, right away for the improvements um, along that segment of, of Rosary. And they also constructed on-street parking, uh, which benefits both the, the development and, and access to the trail. Um, and that is expected to open for leasing uh, next month. And then another project in our Clearwater Largo Road uh, redevelopment area is the Be Alta Bel Air Apartments. Um, this project is about a nine acre uh, site with 255 units. 15% um, is dedicated to workforce housing also for a 30 year term. And that allowed them uh, a density bonus to get up to 28 units uh, per acre. And uh, the construction is about eight, $8 million project is what it's being estimated at. Um, they, they have agreed to build and dedicate also a multi-use path uh, uh, connection from Bel Air Road over to the Pinellas Trail, also adjacent um, to this project. Um, both projects were in uh, were redevelopment sites that were previously um, blighted mobile home parks that that uh, no longer provided safe and, and efficient or decent housing, I should say. Um, the density bonuses were achieved with two incentives: uh, first, the percentage of affordable housing provided. 
Uh, and then also another incentive uh, that uh, if the developer provides relocation assistance to the, to the remaining mobile home residents, that, that's taken into account for the, the density bonus that they receive. In both cases, there were only a few remaining residents uh, in that mobile home park as they were as a result of the deteriorated conditions of the park and, and also the mobile homes that remain. Um, but both, both of these projects emphasize the need for collaboration um, with developers and ultimately led to a win-win um, situation. Uh, so the short-term opportunities we're seeing um, is in our activity centers uh, and, and this slide showing our uh, Largo Tri-City Special Area Plan uh, which is on the verge of being adopted uh, will allow for much greater density incentives for affordable but also combined with green building. Um, the, the plan will allow up to 60 units per acre and um, will include uh, more transit uh, friendly development standards such as uh, less restrictive street, front, uh, street frontage setbacks and reduced parking requirements um, to position the area for future multimodal improvements. Again, it's, it's important where this is located to uh, increase the access for these um, uh, households to the, the places they need to get to. Um, and more importantly, our density bonus is also going to be geared towards um, providing a higher incentive for uh, the provision of affordable units for those um, uh, households that are in greater need, that 80% of the below that, that Jerry had, had mentioned in her presentation. Um, this is also important because the Largo Tri-City area, uh, where it is located, has been designated by HUD as what is known as a difficult to develop area, or what we'll refer to as a DDA. And um, this means the conditions, the land configuration values, um, land regulations have historically made affordable housing projects less feasible in this area. So we really want to focus on how can we make it more feasible, given the the junction here at US 19 and, and Roosevelt Boulevard provides such access to all those places that um, affordable housing residents need to get to work and, and, and other, other uh, services. So as you can see on the map, location does matter, uh, both appropriate for the urban densities, but accessibility of the transportation network. Um, it's critical to incorporate affordable housing components into all of our land use plans and treat it as an essential part of the infrastructure, just like transportation, utilities, and parks. Um, collaboration with the, the development community has been key uh, in our planning efforts. And, and while the, the plan will be adopted until the beginning of 2021, we already have several market rate um, apartment developers that are interested in participating in this program. So there's a lot of excitement about moving forward with this. Um, so while, while the, we're seeing a lot of momentum with larger multifamily projects in Largo, uh, in the long term, city staff is, is, uh, is recognized as working uh, toward a more comprehensive uh, local strategy to address minimum uh, lot sizes, uh, expand on accessory dwelling units, um, revise our codes to address uh, innovations in, in housing types and, and making our uh, citywide uh, density uh, bonus incentive program more attractive to developers, uh, as well as support the county's um, overall strategy that's underway now. Um, and just to touch upon some of the barriers, um, clearly, you know, public perception is, is, a, is a barrier, legacy regulations um, that need to be updated, and um, a lack of infrastructure uh, to support the development as a whole. Uh, until, until we get a more, more well uh, designed affordable housing product on the ground um, that are of a quality that we're now seeing happening, people will continue to have these preconceived um, notions of what affordable housing is going back you know, some 30, 40 years or more. Um, ideally, new housing developments uh, will be of sufficient quality that, that they won't even be distinguishable um, to, to most people. Um, and then just to speak about the infrastructure as a barrier, um, you know, we need enhanced transit, safer streets, uh, multi-use trails to encourage walking and biking and um, uh, access to recreation. Um, we need civic spaces, you know, generally to improve the quality of life for everyone. And, and that's the thing about affordable housing is if we treat it as an essential component of the community, um, it really can benefit everyone. Well, thank you, Rick. I appreciate uh, hearing a little bit more about some of the project examples 
that you're working on in the city of Largo. Um, our third and final speaker for this session is Catherine Hartley. For the past 16 years, Catherine has worked for both the public and private sectors, focusing on the integration of transportation, land use, site planning. She has a unique combination of experience in different sized governments and in the private sector. She has earned recognitions and awards from the American Planning Association, the Florida Planning and Zoning Association, and several other organizations. She specializes in context-sensitive infill development and missing middle housing. Catherine, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my uh, PowerPoint, my screen with you. Here we go. Good morning, I'm Catherine Hartley. Thank you for that great introduction, Blake. That was nice. Um, I'm currently with Tyndale Oliver. I'm the new community planning uh, director. Formerly, I was with the city of Bradenton. I was the planning and community development director with the city of Bradenton for four years. And part of my responsibility was implementing the city's form-based code, as well as our affordable housing programs. So Jerry touched on what affordable housing means as far as income and who it is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about perception for just a minute. I think uh, when you start talking about affordable housing with your elected officials and with the public, there's sort of this perception out there that affordable housing looks like the picture on the left, which is um, the infamous Cabrini Green. It's a huge um, affordable housing federal project um, that started construction in the 1940s um, and continued through the 50s. It was demolished uh, in 1995, thankfully. Um, thousands of units and people who lived there were very segregated from the community and it was a huge concentration of poverty. And folks figured out that wasn't such a great idea. In reality, since 1986, the private sector has primarily been constructing affordable housing through the low income tax credit program, uh, among other things, but that's, that's a, a big program. About two Catherine, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, could you try sharing your screen again? We're not seeing the images. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Here we go. Thank you. Here I am talking away. Let's see what happened. Here we go. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So the picture on the left, that's Cabrini Green. On the right is a picture of um, a low income tax credit project in South Florida. So the program was developed in 1986 by Congress. It's in the federal tax code. Um, about 2 million units have been constructed since then. Um, and about 90% of all affordable housing units since 1986 have, have uh, used, among other things, a low income tax credit project. Uh, program. Um, it's allocated by Congress every year in the budget. About in Florida, it's by state and by population. So in Florida, it comes out to about $3 a person. But the CARES Act recently bumped that up to a little over $5 a person. And that's the limit. So there's not unlimited funding for these projects. Um, there are, if you look at the Florida Housing Finance Corporation process, um, you'll see that there are many more projects that don't get funded than do. And also when you talk to elected officials about the naturally occurring um, affordable housing that Jerry was talking about, when you say the word duplex, I think the picture on the left is sort of what comes to mind a lot of times. In Bradenton, we had several planned development projects move forward that the developer called them paired villas. It's the same thing, the picture on the right, um, unfortunately I couldn't capture the front door because um, it's actually a rather wide uh, building, but that's two units. It's, a, it's attached housing, it's attached single family. Everyone calls it a paired villa. Hundreds of them have been approved through the PD process since the 1970s. What's also important to talk about, and I have to say that pictures are worth a thousand words when you're speaking to the public and to elected officials. 
what it is asking what how does something actually read from the street for instance so if you look at the picture on the top um, left that's a fourplex but you wouldn't really think that that's fourplex if you're walking or driving by um, the same thing goes for the picture on the top right that's also a fourplex it reads like a single family house that's in Hyde Park right by Hyde Park Village um, the other examples on the uh, on the bottom on the bottom right, those are um, stacked duplexes that are connected um, with a, um, a walkway. Um, they're two units each. They, they read like a Charleston single from the street. And in the middle is another street in Ybor City. Um, those, it actually goes from right to left. It's a duplex, a triplex, and then basically multifamily townhomes with a few loft units on the top. As you're walking or driving down the street, you really wouldn't know that one's a duplex, one's a triplex, and one's multifamily. They all read as townhomes. I want to talk a little bit about form-based codes. For some reason, there's a perception that developers won't come to your city if you adopt a form-based code. I can tell you from my personal experience that that is not true. Having, having left, uh, after leaving Bradenton, I've received I'm starting to lose count of how many phone calls of developers who had done a project in Bradenton and want to know where else in the state of Florida has a similar code to Bradenton's because they want to go there and build. Bradenton adopted uh, a version of the smart code and I'll, I'll get to that in just a minute. So the, the point is, if, if your process is set up to administratively approve a project, you, you can't really discount how much money uh, is saved when you're saving time. If you think about the carrying cost of an expensive piece of land, getting something approved rather quickly is very important. There are some communities that have adopted versions of a form-based code, but require a developer to do a rezoning and a public charrette. It's very expensive. It takes a lot of time. And if it's easier to rezone your property PD or to a standard zoning district, that's what they're going to do. So if your city wants a certain urban form, you have to make that easy for the developer to do because if it's a lot of brain damage, they're not gonna do it. So form-based codes focus more on the form, right? Form-based code and less on the use. It regulates what you do want versus what you don't want, right? Uh, and you get a very accurate picture of what something is going to look like. Because for instance, a form-based code will set a build to line. So the build, the building has to be pulled up to, let's say for instance, if a build to line is 10 feet, it has to sit at 10 feet. It doesn't get to set back further than that. As opposed to a setback, if you have a 10 foot setback, the building could be 10 feet, it could be a hundred feet. You don't know what you're gonna get. Um, it also implements missing middle housing. So you have a range of housing types already built in if you do the smart code. Um, I advise folks when they adopt a form-based code, they need to train all users, not just your staff, but the folks that are going to be doing plans, particularly engineering, because the private sector, when they're putting together a, a plan, they start with the stormwater and then design around it, which makes a lot of sense if you're working with a green field, right? Um, design with nature, Ian McCarg, right? That makes sense. When you're in an urban context, however, and you're trying to do infill, you can move that pipe and stormwater anywhere on a site, uh, especially in Florida where it's pretty flat. Um, so th those folks need to know what your expectations are upfront before they spend a lot of money uh, and do a plan and turn it in and it's wrong. So it's important to train to train everybody. Um, and really, I, I highly recommend that you use the administration, uh, administrative powers that form-based codes give you. If you send something to a public hearing, you don't know what's going to happen and neither does the developer. So smart, the SMART code is an open source um, uh, application that you can get from the form-based code um, institute. I had the, the, um, the link on the previous slide. Um, it's available now in Word. It used to just be um, in Adobe software, but now it's in Word and the graphics are in Excel. It's very easy to use. Um, it's a, if you adopt both a regulating plan, which is a typical zoning map, as you see on the right, the color-coded map, everybody's probably familiar with that. 
Um, but there's also a thoroughfare plan. So you map your streets and you basically say up front what those designs you want them to be. And so when you when your public works department, for instance, goes in and has to, you know, pull everything up and redo all the utilities, uh, you have basically a plan already set out for what you want that street to look like later. This was a great tool for the city of Bradenton when FDOT and the public work, our public works department um, was redoing a small section of US 41 and they wanted to run a fence down the middle of the, um, of the street to try and corral pedestrian traffic. But the city's goal was to uh, take the neighborhood that was to the south and, and be able to be more walkable to our downtown. And so DOT looked at our thoroughfare plan and our form-based code, they changed their design and now we have a more pedestrian friendly street with on-street parking on a state highway. It's fantastic. Um, if you adopt the, the SMART code, you're transit ready based on the urban form. You've got, again, the context sensitive complete streets that are already built in. Um, you've got the missing middle housing standards that are already, uh, that are already built in. It focuses more on streetscaping versus the buffering between uses. So a conventional code will often have very stringent um, separations of uses with huge landscaping buffers in between. So, uh, and a lot of times it'll say, okay, a single family house subdivision is one thing, paired villas is another thing, and those things have to be strictly separated and buffered from one another. I don't know, the person living in a paired villa is, probably has a lot in common with the person living in a single family house, why they have to be so segregated, I don't know. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense in an urban context. What's more important is your block structure and walkability if that's what you're trying to accomplish. And if you adopt the SMART code, developers can go from place to place and all the definitions are the same, the graphics are similar. It's just easy to use once they get the hang of it and they can move on to another place and build with ease. I just wanna show you a couple of projects in Bradenton. Um, Blake, how am I doing on time? Going a little long? Very good. Yeah, very good. Okay. So the uh, top left is called the Epic. It's been permitted, but it has not broken ground yet. It's 27 units on less than an acre. They got a parking reduction, um, a little bit of a site design adjustment and adjustment is an administrative variance for those that don't have the lingo. Um, they got a half of a story of a height bonus for doing green building. It's gonna be a LEED certified project a density bonus for affordable housing. It's not a low income tax credit project. This developer just decided that it's now his mission to do affordable housing and he's just getting HUD loans. Um, the Addison on the bottom left, that was done by the housing trust group. I think in the last session you talked to uh, Jake Zeneman who's with H, um, HTG. Um, it's been open for about a, about a year they had a wait list um, before they even broke ground, by the way. It's 94 units. It's a mixed income um, and mixed use project. It's got a little bit of commercial on the ground floor. They got a small density bonus. It is a low income tax credit project. They got a little bit of ship money from the city. Uh, they got a slight reduction in parking. We had to adjust, and again, that's an administrative variance. We had to adjust their front setback because there was a uh, utility easement in the front that was rather sizable. So they had to set back a little bit further. It's been a very successful project. It's got a pool, a dog park. It's actually really nice. And I wanted to move in myself, quite frankly. On the right is uh, Grand Palms. It's a um, senior project. It's 55 and over. Also a low income tax credit deal. And they got a little bit of ship money from the city. 72 units on about three acres. This was a surplus property owned by the CRA. They sold it for about half of, um, of the market value um, to the developer um, and they received impact fee waivers and it opened in 2018 also with a wait list. This is a project that's currently under review by the city. Um, they've already signed their land use agreement with city council. It's just a matter of sort of getting through a couple little issues through the zoning department. They're getting a height bonus for green building and affordable housing, a density bonus. This was also a CRA surplus uh, lot that was sold for less than market value. 
Um, again, this is Pearl Holmes, the same guy that's doing the EPIC that I showed you on the previous slide, um, not a low income tax credit deal. Um, they also received um, or will receive, the city said, okay, uh, a parking reduction. It's on one of the highest frequency transit routes in Manatee County, and they're providing additional bike parking. Um, there is a requirement for them. The block is a little bit bigger than most of the blocks in the area, and the thoroughfare plan in the form based code is showing a connection through the property. Um, but it, the proposed connection is to US 41 Tamiami Trail, and DOT is not going to allow Kirk Cut there. So they have to get an administrative variance for that. Um, and they also have to get a variance from um, the build out in the back. It's a double frontage um, lot. I want to talk just a minute about cottage courts. Um, this is a trending um, topic right now. However, they have a lot of examples historically, um, even, uh, even in this region. Um, there's one here in Bradenton. There are several around the city of Tampa. There's one in St. Pete in the Kenwood neighborhood. In any event, it's single family homes um, on a relatively small lot. So um, the site plan that you see on the right is under construction right now in Bradenton. It's seven units on less than an acre. Um, one thing that you need to look at if you would like to implement this housing type in your code is making sure that you're allowed to have more than one principal building on or principal use on a lot. So this is a single family project, but most codes don't let you have more than one single family house on one lot. And so you have to um, adjust for that. Uh, in the form based code area, we had to give them adjustment for letting them turn in and face the green rather than facing the street. That's really important with form based codes is the front door faces the street and the parking is in the back. Clearly, this doesn't um, quite do that, obviously, um, but um, we really wanted one of these projects to come through. We, we, held, we held the developer's hand uh, through this, and it's going to be a great little, great little project. They got um, a little density bonus. They just needed enough to be able to round up to that seventh unit. One thing that you need to take into account for these kinds of projects is that um, the fire department, your fire marshal, is very sensitive to um, the distance that someone has to make an emergency call. So a lot of times they'll force a developer to have some sort of cul-de-sac, turn around, that kind of thing. But this lot was shallow enough to where they didn't have to do that. They just had to make sure that there was a very clear, identifiable path so that the emergency personnel could get to each unit quickly. Um, this was a surplus city property uh, that was sold for $10,000 a unit. So it was $70,000 for a little less than an acre. Um, and this also was not a low income tax credit deal. I want to talk about tiny homes for just a second. Um, I went to the Tiny House Festival in St. Pete in 2019 and toured, um, gosh, there must have been 50 tiny homes there. Most of them were built to RV standards. They were not mobile homes. They were not modular homes. They were RVs. Um, so basically the way you finance them is, a is it's a 10 year car loan for all intents and purposes. And so you're paying uh, you know, if, it, if the house is $70,000 to $100,000 for less than 400 square feet, you're looking at about the same price per square foot as a stick built house. Um, and then on top of it, you have to pay for rent or pay for the land on top of it. So it's it, the cost, you have to really kind of play with those numbers and see how they come out. They're also a depreciating asset, just like an RV. So keep that in mind. Um, I would recommend them for an emergency housing solution, not an affordable housing solution, particularly because a lot of affordable housing needs are also special needs folks, um, veterans, folks that are disabled, um, older folks. So, and, and particularly if you take ship money, you have to set aside, I think it's 20% for special needs uh, folks. So when you go inside these units, you'll see like the picture on the left, it's, it's tight quarters. Um, 
a wheelchair would be practically impossible in this type of unit. The stairs are very, very steep. It, they're hard to climb. So unless you're, you know, um, physically able to do that, you're not going to be able to get to the loft area. And then you have to crouch down once you get to the loft, you can't stand straight up. And so I think this is a niche market. They're definitely cool and they're very popular right now. I just don't recommend them as a permanent solution for affordable housing. And here are some resources um, about how those different construction types work. Um, John Anderson is a friend of ours uh, with the Incremental Development Alliance. The link to his blog that talks about the different systems is, is at the bottom of the left-hand side. Um, so tiny homes are, it's not just about the square footage. Again, it's about the construction type. You can have a smaller home that's about 500 or 600 square feet, like the Ybor City example there in the center but those are stick built homes and not a depreciating asset. Here are some things you can do today to support affordable housing and basically infill in general. Um, inclusionary zoning was, uh, was, was hindered by some changes to Florida statute in 2019. So if you can't do an inclusionary housing zoning, uh, inclusionary housing ordinance now, because it requires you to make the develop, developer whole, just get rid of your exclusionary zoning. And you can do that by allowing ADUs everywhere. And I call that general density. I can tell you um, that when I was the director here in Bradenton, all of the calls that I got uh, from people who wanted to build an ADU were dealing with an aging parent that wanted to maintain um, some independence, but they also needed to be looked after. All of our zoning districts in Bradenton, except for one, are our one um, standard single family zoning district. That was the only one that didn't allow for ADUs in the code. And so I was able to take a look at how we defined what a dwelling unit was. And typically um, conventional zoning codes call a dwelling unit, a dwell it's a dwelling if it has a stove or cooking facilities in it. So our code allowed for accessory structures that could be you know, rather sizable, about 600 square feet. Um, and above a garage, it could be even larger. So what I did was uh, I allowed the units to be built and told the, the builders and the families that um, I said, go ahead and plumb and put in electric for cooking facilities and for a kitchen. Just don't drop that stove in. We're working on updates to our code. It'll be about a year. And that's how we were able to um, allow those units to be built. Um, you can re remove the definition of family from your code if you have one. Um, it's you can't enforce it. It's very difficult. It's not like you're going to have your code enforcement officer walk up and get a blood sample from people to prove that they're related. Um, a lot of folks now are having to um, share homes and single family or single um, occupancy. Uh, you know, in the old days when when um, people would rent out a large house and rent out the rooms, that's coming back in fashion, trying to reduce housing costs. You can eliminate um, your parking requirements or at least significantly reduce them. Um, essentially, when you have um, a 10 by 20 parking, like that's the size of a parking space, right? It's 200 square feet. When you add a drive aisle on top of that and you require two spaces per unit, you've already required for parking the same size as what an ADU would be. Um, it uh, takes up a lot of space. It takes up stormwater because of all the pavement. Just think about reducing those for affordable housing. Um, typically, folks that need affordable housing don't have the same car ownership as everyone else. And so you really don't need that much parking. Just um, observe what your current affordable housing projects are in your city and take a look at who's parking there at what times of day. You'll find out that the parking lots are about half empty. Um, don't treat your residential units as if they're uh, incompatible with one another. Um, again, that's looking at your landscaping and buffering requirements. Think about your driveway widths and your lot sizes that are in your code. A lot of times a code will require a 24 foot wide driveway. That's really big. Um, a 10 foot driveway is more than adequate. Um, and look at your lot sizes. Um, the little bungalow that's in the, um, in the slide, um, that's on a 36 foot wide lot. It's a 1200 square foot house. 
start thinking about those smaller lot sizes. Um, the unit size, uh, a lot of codes will have a minimum square footage for residential units, 600 square feet and up. You don't have to do that, take it out of your code. Um, and also you might wanna think about expanding um, your home-based businesses, uh, especially now in these times. Um, being able to have one customer come to your house, for instance, if you cut hair or you're a barber, being able to have someone come to you right now is uh, very convenient. And um, allow for your garage conversion. So if you have a detached garage in the back that might be left over from the 1920s and 30s in your historic neighborhoods, it might not meet your current setback requirements, but that's okay. Make sure it meets your fire code and your building code and allow those to convert to a unit. Um, some other incentives that um, you can offer um, and our typical uh, strategies in your SHIP program, take a look at what your incentives are in that document in your uh, LHAP. Uh, the density bonuses, again, that's very common, but if you're requiring two spaces per unit, it really will hinder how many units you can get on a lot. So again, rethink your parking. Impact fee waivers, those are legal in Florida statute. You can simply waive the impact fees, um, except for schools, check your school um, impact fee ordinance. Expedited permitting, very common. Um, you're actually required by Florida statute, whether you get ship money or not, to look at your local government's uh, surplus properties and evaluate them for affordable housing. It doesn't give you standards to evaluate them. You have to just kind of come up with that on your own but you're required to do that review every three years and send that to your governing body, your city council, county commission, whatever. Um, and they adopt a resolution saying, here's what we're going to make available. Nobody knows that that's in the statute, but it's there. And I cited the sections for you. And then again, look at your local housing assistance plan um, and look at the strategies that you already have adopted and make sure that you're actually doing them. And I included a link at the bottom to the Florida housing website that has a list of all the uh, adopted um, LHAPs right now. Here's some other resources for you really quick. Um, if you're struggling to figure out how much affordable housing your community needs, you go to, to the um, Schimberg Center website in their clearinghouse. They will tell you what you need um, along with your general population projections out to 2040 is the, um, is the current date. It goes by 30% of area median income, 60% and, oh, sorry, 50% and 80%. So it'll tell you exactly what you're gonna need for the up to 2040. If you want a list of what low income tax credit projects are already in your community, um, that's the link that will tell you that by address. It's very handy. It doesn't cover things like um, um, Habitat for Humanity or other projects that your local government um, funded, but it does cover the things that got um, assistance through the Florida Housing uh, uh, Development Corporation. Um, how do you determine what rent and purchase uh, price limits? Again, there's a link that gives you that information for your community. Uh, how do you incorporate resiliency planning into affordable housing? That's a, a, a hot topic right now as well. The University of Florida has provided a fantastic website for you to be able to look at um, sea level rise and storm surge uh, and maps out the projects um, that the Schimberg Center uh, listed in that link above. So you can see exactly where your affordable housing projects are today compared to where flood zones are where sea level rise might occur based on, you know, one to two feet and that sort of thing. So you can map it all out. I recommend that you download that data into your GIS, map that out with your transit lines and you have a pretty good idea of where your affordable housing should go. And if you want information on how you yourself can build a project in your neighborhood, like an ADU, or you found a great vacant lot and you wanna build a paired villa, um, you can go to the Incremental Development um, uh, Facebook page. It's a free resource. Those folks are amazing. They will tell you how to find a site, how to finance things. By the way, you can finance one to four units with a standard um, FHA loan for 30 years, just like you would for a single family house. 
um, and they just uh, are just an amazing group, Incremental Development Alliance on Facebook. And if you have any questions, um, obviously we're gonna take Q&A in a minute, but you can also email me there. And I wanna thank the Incremental Development Alliance for the amazing graphic that they shared with me that I can share with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate all the very uh, detailed insight and you know, for giving us some practical examples about how we might be able to do this. We have a little over 20 minutes now for our question and answer period. So if you do have a question for our panelists, please type them in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And you can also give a thumbs up to questions that other people have asked. I'd like to start off, if I may, um, as we switch into this policy approach and talk a little bit about, um, a number of you touched on some of those uh, techniques and tactics that are being used that are a little bit more common like uh, density bonuses and infill. We're starting to see a new national conversation happening around this concept of upzoning. In fact, there was an article that was published last year in the New York Times that talked about the proliferation of single family zoning across the country. And they, they provided a statistic that said that um, of those properties that are zoned for residential, 75% of those are uh, exclusive to single family residential. And so we start to see other cities, other states that are now thinking about essentially eliminating single family zoning. So Minneapolis talked a little bit about um, outlawing it and now they allow by right three units uh, per lot. Uh, the state of Oregon has a slight variation depending on the city sizes. So I'm curious to hear from our panelists just, uh, you know, about the, you know, where you stand or how you anticipate the utilization of those type of techniques in terms of eliminating single family. What's applicable? What is it not? And this can be a little bit more of a free-form discussion. How about Jerry? Can I pick on you? Any thoughts on that? Sure. So um, very interesting discussion. I've read a lot about um, um, the, the Minneapolis example. Um, a lot of it really depends on your kind of the community. You know, looking at Manatee County, um, we are a very suburban community and single family homes really are kind of our, our bread and butter. So something like this um, would take a lot of political will depending on kind of what it is. So from a, a general county perspective, I think that would be a very hard sell. Um, for us, um, we are looking at in our more um, developed neighborhoods, um, being able to allow ADUs. Actually, our board just had a land use meeting yesterday and they had their first reading on it. So we're just treading very carefully. So we're doing uh, baby steps to see how that works, what that looks like. But we really are focused on our redevelopment areas and really being able to add uh, some of those opportunities and, and additional density within that and not necessarily looking at kind of more of our suburban areas where you really have more of your, your classic um, single family. So it really is depends where it's located within our county that we would kind of take a look at that. Catherine or Rick, any thoughts on that? I touched on that um, briefly in my presentation. So um, eliminating single family zoning in Florida, I think, I think would go over like a ton of bricks, quite frankly. Um, but again, if you look at a cottage court um, example, it's still single family. It's just allowing more than one single family on a lot. So I think that's probably a much easier sell than eliminating single family altogether. And also accessory dwelling units, I think is also a, a, a much easier sell. And again, it has to do with um, our, our aging population. I know that I'm thinking about my parents um, and, and what's gonna happen with them in the future. And my brothers and I are, all right, who's gonna take mom, who's gonna take dad? And so I've been looking for a house with, a, with an ADU in the back, knowing that I'm gonna have to deal with that in the future. I think those are much easier sells. Quite frankly. Yeah, one one other thing I wanted to um, talk about. Um, I'm really glad that that Catherine mentioned vocabulary and the paired villas. Um, so we're working with our local Habitat for Humanity on an infill project where they're actually doing a very small subdivision of 16 units, and uh, they have about. 
three or four paired villas within that. So it's still single family and you have your traditional standalone single family, but there's about three paired villas. Um, so it's a much higher density, kind of small subdivision, but it's right within our redevelopment area and uh, has a much higher kind of density. So that's something that's much more palatable and much more doable. Rick, any thoughts from you? Yes, I mean, I would agree with uh, Jerry and Catherine about, you know, in Florida, it's, it's, uh, there's going to be challenges. Um, I think many communities probably aren't ready for it. Citywide upzoning. Um, I, I do believe that in Largo and in many areas in Pinellas County, that there is um, a much um, higher comfort level with higher density, but it's, it, it really at this point is still where it's located. And that's why our approach is to focus on those activity centers and corridors. Um, but uh, there is also a need to address some <clears throat> legacy regulations that, that may not treat um, certain housing types equally. Um, and I think some of that work can start to begin and certainly with uh, uh, expanding ADUs, we allow ADUs in a very limited area in our down, around the downtown area in the CRA. But uh, expanding that, and you know, as we see more of these um, villas uh, uh, popping up, and um, I, I think the more product we get on the ground, I think people will become more comfortable with it. It, it really has to do with the design and demonstrating that it can be compatible and indistinguishable. <clears throat> and a part of that, if we stop, you know, buffering everything. Um, you know, it, it will be less uh, distinguishable because it will fit in with the existing urban uh, footprint. We talked a little bit about in the presentation from Catherine, but uh, just in general, thinking about the utilization of form-based codes. And there's a there's a um, attendee question that talks about wanting to know a little bit more about affordable housing. And if I can add on to that a little bit, you know, we see form-based codes coming in. And I was wondering if you all could touch on not only the affordable housing component, but whether or not you feel that the use of form-based codes works better at a um, kind of an area-wide uh, scale, in other words, like a downtown or an activity center like Rick talked about, um, or whether it's a citywide approach. Do you see benefits to one versus the other? Um, and is one of them geared a little bit more effectively towards affordable housing? Bradenton's form-based code uh, covers about a third of the city. So um, a little greater than our areas that are covered by uh, community redevelopment areas. The city of Miami has the exact same code. It's um, a version of the SMART code, but it covers the entire city. Um, and I think that made a lot of sense for the city of Miami because they have an established grid and you can just really plug and play the SMART code. Um, and I think Pinellas County in particular um, most of the jurisdictions in Pinellas County could adopt a citywide form-based code very easily because you do have that grid set up. St. Pete, oh my gosh, they could very easily adopt a citywide form-based code. And the thing about form-based codes, when you concentrate on the block and the block size and not so much on the lot sizes, and it doesn't establish, again, the minimum, um, a minimum unit size. You can get such a variety um, and get that higher density. We did, um, Bradenton's form-based code didn't have density in it. It, re it relayed back to the comprehensive plan, which makes 100% sense in an, in an urban area and also in Pinellas County that has a very high build out already. Um, so not having to repeat that or having a lower density in your code than your plan makes a lot of sense. And I think that you are able to get more naturally occurring affordable housing versus subsidized with a form-based code. Um, there was a question from our audience that wanted to know a little bit more about who owns the lots in the cottage style development when multiple homes are on that lot. Is it under a common ownership or are they, um, subdivided um, into the smaller lot configuration? The example that we have under construction in Bradenton is not platted. So the ground is, um, is, an, is, an, is owned by the HOA, essentially. So it's, it's condoized for all intents and purposes. 
And Rick or Jerry, have either of you had experience where your local government organizations are the landowners and then are selling uh, you know, the, the project or getting somebody to come in and build on government owned land? So for us, um, we are just, um, we're just starting that process right now. As I mentioned, one of the things that we had tackled is trying to get some additional funding for land acquisition. Um, so we want to be able to do that. Um, we have very little surplus land available and those that we did have, we have already been working with uh, different um, nonprofit developers and um, to be able to um, just um, provide them for a dollar to be able to develop. So we're looking at trying to get those um, larger lots through just uh, land acquisition. So we haven't done that yet. Rick, you were going to say? Uh, yeah, in Largo, we've we've had some initial discussions with uh, Habitat for Humanity, looking at uh, building a um, a subdivision uh, of both mixed, uh, affordable, and market rate. And I think one of the factors they were considering is a land trust. Um, so to take that that cost out and and preserve those affordable units in perpetuity. Okay, I wanted to take a minute and. Um, move into a couple um, practical approaches and, and, and put up a slide here in a minute that is gonna show kind of side-by-side -side comparison of some of the more common uh, or things that are becoming a little bit more common. And then those that might be a little bit more in that innovative space that we're here to talk about. And one of the pieces that comes out in that conversation is this concept. And I think uh, you all touched on this a little bit is this idea about adaptive reuse. Um, we start to see that take shape in older type of buildings, like the image on the left where you have a barn that's converted into a uh, multifamily um, or a condominium style development. Um, if any of you have watched HGTV, that's the uh, barn dominium that they talked about versus the image on the right, which is uh, in a more urban context where you have retail space on the ground floor and the upper floors then get converted into um, office or housing. Um, and that's typically a way that we see adaptive reuse for older buildings. There's also a consideration of how to move forward and think forward in terms of how to build buildings that can be adaptively reused during the life cycle of that building. So here you see an example of State Street Garage in Sarasota, where typically the um, garage is built with ramp style, um, where the floors are are graded out. And in this particular example, they built flat floors with an external ramp and they go through and now that building can be converted into um, affordable housing or other things during the life cycle. And you don't have to take that building down in its entirety and replace it with something else. Do you all have examples in your communities or communities you've worked in or, or um, experiences or you've seen adaptive reuse really come in and be a part of the discussion? So um, we worked on one, um, very interesting. This was a motel um, that uh, has been converted to um, almost like a, um, almost like almost single room occupancy, not necessarily so, cause there's some that have like um, more than one in there, but um, this took a lot of uh, programming with our code because you're uh, changing the land use from uh, a hotel use to a single family use. So there was a lot of work from our code that we needed to do, but it was successfully done and it's over um, 300 units of um, affordable housing. Um, we did help to subsidize just a portion of those um, to be able to kind of pay some of the school impact fees because that was one of the issues that had kind of come up that um, those impact fees weren't paid at the beginning, they had to be paid at the end, but they did have to do some renovation work to be able to turn the hotel units into more um, livable units, add that kitchen element. Um, so, um, so we do have an example of that here in, in Manatee County. Some of the great examples um, that we have are um, they're mostly uh, conversions uh, between commercial uses for the adaptive reuse. However, the city put together a grant program for um, our for our Main Street. Um, Main Street has a lot of um, 
restaurants and things like that on the ground floors of the buildings, but they're all two stories. Um, and the second story um, has either remained vacant for decades in a lot of these buildings or have just been used for office space or storage space. And we really wanted to get uh, encourage uh, res the residential conversion of that second story. So we established a grant program for that. There was a misconception that you couldn't have residential on the second floor, which isn't true. Um, they were, for a zoning and land use perspective, they are, you're 100% able to do that conversion. You just have to meet building and fire code. The issue was our water pressure downtown. Uh, and so uh, you wouldn't be able to take a great shower <laughs> if you converted to residential above. And so that's what we established a, a grant program for was to um, be able to help people offset the cost of having to do um, new sprinkler systems to address that, um, as well as being able to get that water pressure up. Those pumps are really expensive. And so that, that was something that we had to do programmatically. Um, but this, from the zoning perspective, you didn't have to do anything, didn't have to provide any new parking, didn't have to worry about new landscaping. You just focused on the guts of the building, meeting building code, get your permit, have a nice day. We have a question from our audience that I wanted to um, pose to you all. We talked a little bit about the different incentives that were available for building affordable housing. And the question really comes in and says, you know, how, how much do you have to adjust the incentives as you go through those negotiations? Is it a, is it a bit more formulaic or is every project, um, you know, unique and you have to adapt or adjust in terms of which, which incentives that you may uh, provide? So can you speak to that? Every project is unique. They all have their own site design challenge. Um, and again, I'm going to tout the form-based code you're able to um, be able to sit down with the developer and look at the site conditions and make adjustments. Again, those are administrative variances um, on a case by case basis, um, rather than sending them through a variance process. So when you send something to, through the variance process to a public hearing, 99% of the time, the applicant can't meet the legal requirements because what's a hardship? Like what's the, what's, you know, um, and it's just, it's things that they can't really show a hardship on like the parking. Well, if it's not a transit line, it makes sense that you don't have to have as much parking, but they don't really have a hardship. They could just reduce the number of units, but you're trying to encourage more units. Just being able to sit down and work that out, I, I think is just a huge advantage. From, um, from our perspective, um, I mentioned that Habitat for Humanity project and absolutely each project is unique and they're all different and you have to approach it that way, especially if it's an infill kind of project because there's always something that's different. So for that one, we really have lots of layers of programs and funding to be able to make that project a reality. So we're using our community development block grant to do the infrastructure of it. Um, we're using our livable manatee program to be able to do, uh, to pay for those uh, impact fees. And then as part of the project, as it went through that site planning process, one of the things that came up is that there was really, um, Catherine talked about water pressure. This was another thing. There was insufficient water with the existing utilities to be able to service that project. So when we were first going through um, the project, it, it looked like it was fine. And then once all those calculations were done, it was clearly that we needed an upgrade for the water line. And so this is all offsite headed to this project. And as an affordable housing project, they could not afford that. So we were able with a program through our redevelopment area, through our TIF dollars, actually upgrade the infrastructure um, and pay for that um, to be able to make that project a reality. So that one has a CDBG agreement, it has a TIF agreement, it has a livable manatee, Laura, uh, among many other things to be able to get that project going. And like that, all of our projects, they're, they're all different in how they're, they're structured. This one that we're working on with a mixed income rental project, um, uh, that one uh, doesn't have uh, TIF money in it, but it will have a home um, a home loan um, as part of kind of the HUD funding. So they're all different. They're all unique. It's about what needs to happen to be able to make it a reality and being flexible. Uh, for Largo, uh, the density bonus incentive uh, program 
has evolved and um, varies in the community redevelopment area versus citywide and then our other um, activity centers and and so you know that we're working on trying to maybe make that a little more uniform but you know every project is different but we also want to make sure that we have kind of a scaled uh, incentive so that we're incentivizing more of those those groups that are in the higher need um, as well as um, we're trying to incorporate green building so that through both affordable housing and green building they can um, you know, get more density and the green building component also has a, a long-term benefit for those um, affordable um, housing residents because it will save them costs and and things like energy and, and utilities and so forth um, so you know there's a lot of different uh, incentives and in other programs to help them um, in, in help developers with these projects and then i think it's incumbent on us to make it um, easy for them to understand the uh, benefits that are uh, and incentives that are available to them and and to utilize them to the best of their ability to, to create a good product thank you i want to let you know we're running a little short on time so we're going to try to sneak in maybe one or two more questions um, if folks are able to hold on with us a little bit longer and join us then that's great um, I wanted to touch a little bit on some of the innovative construction techniques that we kind of see out in the marketplace and see if you um, feel they have any merit. We have a poll that um, we have, we can put up on the screen to talk a little bit about some of the different options. And it's an opportunity for our participants to tell us which ones they may be more intrigued with. So we're gonna um, go ahead and identify on our poll the um, the different options. There's one for tiny homes, and we touched a little bit on that in Catherine's um, presentation. We've also heard a little bit about container homes. There's even a new practice that talks about 3D printing of homes. Um, in Dr. T's uh, presentation in session one, we heard a little bit more about, um, you know, kit homes where you could actually buy homes um, on Amazon or in, in past uh, Sears Robux used to have them available or pre-approved plans. So these are different ideas that are out there that are in the community. Um, and I'm curious to hear what our participants might wanna use the last couple minutes of our presentation to hear more about. So if you take a moment, indicate on the screen what you're most interested in hearing about and we'll, we'll wrap up with this final question. If you haven't had the opportunity to take a minute and indicate that on the screen. All right, um, so it looks like there's an interest in our uh, attendees to hear a little bit more about pre-approved plans. So we have an example here where there's a website that has, um, and you can use this particular site of going in and identifying the site of home you want, the scale, the number of bedrooms, and then have pre-approved plans. Have any of you used this um, function or this feature in your respective communities? Um, or would you be open or willing to, you know, bring in that type of opportunity uh, within your communities? That was the one thing I wanted to do that I couldn't get done before I left the city. Um, what I tried to do with Habitat for Humanity um, was show them the, so the National Habitat for Humanity has um, a wonderful pattern book that was developed. And all the examples that were in that pattern book met our form-based code automatically. So I handed the, that to the local habitat and said, use your own guide. This meets our code, at least for zoning. Um, the pre-approved building plans was the, was the one thing I really wanted to do. And we couldn't quite figure out how to fund it unless I asked for general fund money. I wanted to use some leftover CDBG money, but it, it got sort of caught up in not being able to use um, the plans for anyone else unless it was tied to the CDBG. So that got a little bit hairy, um, but I, I would love, I would jump at the opportunity to do that for sure, 100%. 
This is something that we have also talked about um, as part of uh, one of our redevelopment strategies. We have some neighborhoods that were done um, in the 1950s that would be great candidates for starter single family homes, but they need renovation. So we were talking about perhaps bringing on an architect, developing the plan so that it's something that it's just off the shelf that, that people could use. Um, it's been a little busy here, so we haven't been able to do that, but that's something that we've been thinking about. But, um, but this is something that um, when I was in the, um, the city of Clearwater, we did this more with um, a facade program. So it is, and we did do it with CDBG. So it is something that can be done where you can try to use an architect to have help with some of the designing to be able to, to get that going. So I, I definitely think it's a great strategy that um, deserves some, some looking into. I agree, it's definitely a, a strategy that um, I think the city of Largo um, could consider, especially when we talk about um, expediting um, you know, plans reviews. If we have a set of, of uh, pre-approved plans, we could facilitate that process a lot quicker. Well, great. Well, we're about out of time, so I want to take an opportunity, uh, Catherine, Jerry, Rick, to really thank you for your thoughts and your, uh, and your insight on these. It's been extremely interesting to hear the different things that you all are working on. So I really appreciate your time and, and participation today. So um, for those of you that are attending, if you weren't able to join us for the two, first two sessions or see this session in its entirety, you can view these series on the county's YouTube channel or at homesforpinellas.org. The recording of this session will be available online on Monday. Our next session is on November 20th and will focus on coordinating housing with transportation, safe streets, job and workforce development. Be sure to sign up at homesforpinellas.org. Thank you for joining us today and have a great weekend.